Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and I am broadcasting from jolly old England this evening, and uh, very happy to have as my second guest, Jerry Avalos, is coming on the show to talk about his latest inventions, I guess you might call them, and uh, things that he's working on that have to do with holograms and free energy, in essence. So, so we're going to be talking about that tonight and welcoming your calls. We can, we can take questions towards the end of the program, maybe the last 45 minutes or so. Jerry, if you could give yourself an introduction, um, because I'm not sure what to call you or <laughs> how to refer to what you do. Um, I have done a live broadcast with you and, and some other people. Stephen Kelly was on it, uh, a few other people at the time, but... Uh, yeah, it'd be great if you could describe what you're doing and also talk about. You are working with um, with Jeff. Uh, gosh, what's his name? Jeff Harvey. 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 Yeah, I don't know why his last name always escapes me. Lovely man, and I've had him as my guest several times. And so, so we should also maybe mention him uh, and who else, ever else you'd like. But uh, please do give yourself an introduction. My. Uh background for the most part is on paper it would almost be you know pretty indescript but um, I have uh, had an interesting past relating to some my lab projects before and got into fabrication early in my life and had stuck with it now for over 10 years and at one point some of the intuitive applications that I had been employing as a natural lucid dreamer um, really to made a tangible appearance with the technology that I'm working with currently, which is a, a type of a scalar and quantum application that we use to treat you know, bodies, um, plants, animals, you know, cars, and all kinds of fun stuff. And that involves some interesting technology and fun uh, ways of delivering, like holograms and. We have a uh, you know, lot of uh, fun people working with us who have, uh, you know, I, I jokingly refer to them as my pedigrees, uh, the people who uh, have went through the academic system and have gotten their, you know, bachelors, PhDs, masters, and so on and so forth. And, um, and it's pretty interesting because I, I kind of, in a sense, consider myself one of the, the examples of what one can do and when they apply themselves in quantum mechanics because what they do say about going through school for physics doesn't necessarily teach you quantum mechanics <laughs> so um, pretty much a living example of how you don't necessarily have to have the mathematics degree to be able to really do some some interesting stuff and how for me it really did all start from a spiritual point of self-understanding and self-growth um, through the application of lucid dreaming and intuitive um, devices, I guess you could say. Okay, well, uh, yes, but I will also say that you're sort of a budding inventor of a sort, and um, and and that is 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 what we're really going to be talking about tonight. Uh, and I guess that your background kind of contributes to your openness and receptivity in this area. And maybe also your what appears to be history of being um, I don't know messed with and abducted <laughs> um, <laughs> and as a as a as a, a a sort of my lab super soldier esque individual um, I'm not sure you would call yourself that but just so people can begin to kind of go down that 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 road because actually people don't realize that people have hidden talents and those talents can come from past lives they can come from current lives in which you are being utilized in the astral in all sorts of ways um, and so on so we're we're actually you know as I as I say and as most people realize that listen to these programs we are multi-dimensional beings and that is absolutely literal not just figurative when you talk about it so so that's where all of this gets kind of tied together in in your trajectory um, but I would love it if you would start to sort of talk about maybe how you got connected with Jeff and also how you kind of started down this road um, because you weren't down this road at least I think a, at least a year ago or so 
Yeah, with with the, this particular type of product and application, yeah, it's been about a year now. Um, and Jeff and I actually started working, I want to say maybe 2010, um, we started consulting each other. Um, I have been following Jeff's work for a couple of years, and finally I decided to get in contact with him. And um, once we had a chance to chat, um, he learned more about my background and, and my lucid dreaming prowess and so on. And so he figured, uh, like most people, I make a great guinea pig. So <laughs> he, had, he has his uh, great concoctions, uh, his homeopathic concoctions and hardware that he works with too. And so he had sent me some of his stuff to try out and get my opinion on. And I was always also bouncing um, ideas off of him in terms of, you can say, that navigating the multiverse um, astrally or psychically. Because um, Jeff also does have a, a background in, in military remote viewing and uh, naval communications. Um, so uh, so we have been working together um, on that sense. We've been consulting each other on our projects um, for quite some time. And um, and I could say that, yes, his concoctions were great. Um, and uh, there actually was a pretty even funny story about that when, um, when he first sent me something. And it, it just worked so well that I had this experience where I just closed my eyes in my meditation and it was almost instantaneously, I'm sitting next to myself, you know, projection-wise, and I'm like, okay, that, that made that too easy. Um, so, pretty, pretty fun stuff. But, um, but yeah, and then uh, what ended up happening, and actually this is kind of a fun time um, for me right now, because I get, I'm excited to tell people the truth about uh, a lot of things that are out there, and it relates to the business I'm in now, with the holograms, radionic applications, scalar applications. So um, I had the, I encountered a person, how, oh, this is just a preface, this is how I got into this technology now. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into this, because, and Jeff vectors his way back in in a fun way here. Um, so what happens is that I am at a event, local event down here that a promoter was putting on, um, and I met, met an interesting person who had these holograms and was saying that it can reduce emissions on cars and so on and so forth. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, and at the time, you know, our, our esteemed colleague Matt Pulver was there too. And so we both were sitting there questioning the physics about this. Now, Matt at the time definitely did not get, you know, his fill of what he needed for validation. And that didn't come until sometime later, sometime later with our research, not necessarily this person's research. Um, and um, and what what I saw when I went back and researched this product was testimonials on YouTube that verified what was being said. And what I also found interesting was months later when I ran into this character again, and I went to search these videos, pretty much most of them had been wiped off of YouTube, and there was a good 30 or so individual um, tries of this product. And so... And I thought that was kind of peculiar, especially you know having a, a history working with, with you and Tommy over at Camelot, and seeing things wiped off the internet quite often. Um, and so that's and you know sharing that sort of investigative you know itch, shall we say? I wanted to find out more about this because there was something about this character that didn't quite sit right. Um, but at the same time, I'm seeing some results. And so as I investigated more, I saw more results. And um and as I got closer, I've got to see how it was done. And once I saw how it was done, then this is where Jeff comes in when I asked him, okay, I, when I told him about this character because he's very shady, and told him that this is the hardware that he's using, it's like, oh, I think I know what it is. Is it this? And he sends me a picture, and it's a, a machine called the SE5-1000, which actually is commercially available, and you can buy it. Um, and uh, and this is one of the machines that's used in this process. And so from there, that's when essentially, um, just kind of getting right to it, this other person who used to go by the name of Thunder White Cloud, I'm not sure if he still does or not, um, where I confronted him with, with the truth of the matter is that he's been lying to everybody. I know he's been lying to everybody. He's been lying to me. But I know the technology is working, and that's what he's using to prey on people. So he can come clean with me, or we're going to have to see each other on the other side, proverbial side of the line here. And so he chose the second. So, um, okay, okay, but 
at this point, we're going to sort of, I mean, I can't delete the name that you've already said, but I'd like to sort of steer this away from any kind of targeting. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is, um, you know, this is, this is definitely something that's true. It has to be said because it's a detriment and people have almost died from this. It's very important and there's nothing I can be sued for, you can be sued for because it's true. So, okay, well, um, I appreciate that, but let's, let's talk about the technology itself because I mm -hmm. want to understand, I'm sure people want to understand because this is still very vague for people who are, are not familiar with the holograms and how you're, what you're doing and what you're working with. So mm -hmm. we kind of have to, you know, start at the beginning a little more in terms of um, like this machine you mentioned. This machine, yeah. is this something that is a known machine yeah. to people out there because you gave a number and what does the machine do? It's actually, um, it's called, once again, it's called SE5-1000. And ironically enough, Jeff Harvey ha happened to be a distributor, like a, a, a you know a distributor of it, and um, so he was able to uh, set us up with a you know the manufacturer and everything, and, and it's been out for quite a while now. And the there actually is an origin of the machine's history, and on I think on the website and I know in the manual, and apparently it came from a professor in Stanford who was doing research uh, along the lines, kind of like what Rife was doing. Um, and uh, but was primarily interested in at first okay, in. You mean using, Wilhelm, did you mean Wilhelm Reich? Um, no, Reich, not um, oh, Reich, yeah. like the Reich machine, R I. Exactly. F yeah, which is a okay. uh, little, yeah, a little different. Um, and maybe for those who are, don't know the delineation, the uh, Wilhelm Reich was the one who talked about organ material, and then the Reich, uh, Reich and Reich machines have to do with interjection of radio waves into a static field. Um, so this is more closer to the Rife machines. Um, and so what it's doing, it's, it's creating scalar patterns um, that uh, over the period of research and development has been refined to the point where it's very accurate at, for instance, at picking out different uh, minerals, minerals and mineral deposits. Um, that was one of the original uh, applications of, of the technology when it was being developed. And at this point, it's been developed to be used for just about anything you can really put your mind and heart towards, really. Um, except for maybe some malicious stuff, because that's one of the things that actually is really neat uh, about the, the machine and, and uh, the manufacturer. Um, we, Jeff and I inquired, because you know we're practical about things, um, about these kind of things. and and. Uh, they have hardwired some way into their machine where it's very difficult to just say, you know, try to just kill someone with it. It's just not going to work. <laughs> so it's just not meant for that. It's uh, you can at best heal bomb somebody. Um, but the fun thing is, but, but this um, this machine is this uh, classically known as a Rife machine, or is this another machine that Rife just happened to have some kind of part of creating? I would say that this would fall more under the radionic category, but it might actually fall into something else entirely because it integrates the concept of the radio dial to, or that, that tuning aspect to cre create precision longitudinal interference patterns with the circuitry involved in it. So I guess it would be kind of closer to a Rife machine. Um, but okay. it's kind of it's more of like an evolution, and there has been more evolutions in this type of hardware, which um, I'm sure Jeff would love to talk about. He's he's more um, versed okay, on. Okay, but love. why? Okay, well, why did you guys? <laughs> why did you center on this machine? What was the purpose? Because um, what ended up happening is that I mean, it's pretty much one of the best machines that you can just buy on the market. Um, anything else takes significant effort to either create your on your own or do um, a lot of customization. Um, and even with this machine in particular, there's stuff and stuff to do out of the box, like do a lot of healings and such, but like what we use it for outside of just those applications for research, that you do have to have some, you know, first-hand knowledge in the subject you're going into, and at least some creativity. Um, but, okay, but uh, so is this a device that assists in targeting or as you say, you say tuning, tuning into, or 
Yeah, you can say that. It's because it actually has multiple functions, but let's say one of the functions relating to targeting and tuning is these um, these interference patterns. The this um, and I know other guests on your show have talked about the scalar concept of when you have you know let's say if you push your hands together you know in the center of your uh, of your body and you push on them hard as you can, you're technically using a lot of energy, but your net work is zero. So somewhere all the, that energy is there, and you, you have that that compression going on. And so what we're doing is we're utilizing that that sort of negative yield to also carry information, but also send information. So, and this in a lot of ways correlates with traditional energy healing as well with the hemispheres of the brain, because um, your both hemispheres are firing. There, there's a longitudinal interference pattern, which in a sense is that is the scalar field or scalar and the scalar vector. Say in that in that situation would be your intention of healing. So the information that comprises what that healing is. So if it's if it's antibacterial, it's focusing on a negative wave of a sustaining bacterial life of a certain type. So what we're doing essentially is the same thing say an energy healer might do but we have hardware that can do uh, do some of that for us okay but uh is let me ask you this is the is the sort of is this going in the direction of, of the hologram and then if it is is the hologram the strength of the 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 hologram dependent on you and the machine working together or is it the machine the one that carries the charger carries the, the the message, and that it's not dependent on how strong of a healer you are. That's a great question. Um, I would say that the the great this is a testament to the manufacturing of this machine is that they've refined it enough to where you can do a lot of good without ever having to interject what's called the operator or the person who's using it into the code directly with without too much detriment or benefit in a sense because of so much work that has already been done from prior operators and the feedback they've gotten. There's a great catalog in there that pretty much anyone can use. Now at the same time, if you have an operator who is in tune, who does know how to calibrate their biochemical and bioetheric circuit with some kind of measurable acuity, they're going to be more effective at this, yes. Okay, very interesting. Uh, okay, so at this point, y am I am I to understand that you obtained one of these machines? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, and then did Jeff also have one? Yeah, Jeff ha has his own machine and a few others. <laughs> so. Okay, and and then at that point, you decided to make holograms. Well, the holograms is, are actually something that is a known way of transferring this information. Um, it's uh, because of the nature of holograms themselves, which I'm sure you've had many shows on too. Um, that there's a it, we find it easy to entangle our information with the holograms because it's this is my theory. Um, I could be wrong, I don't know, but it seems to me it does relate to the materials themselves and, in a sense, how they are very similar in a sense is what people talk about as organite because you have a conductive material and a dielectric and, and it's layered so that that tends to be some, something that you see reappearing in a lot of high end technology including aircraft parts and their wings and such there's almost the exact same thing you have a conductive metal and a dielectric in a coherent pattern and so uh, well wait one second what's a dielectric is that the machine Oh, a dielectric is something that doesn't conduct electricity. So, like rubber, for instance, doesn't. It w is kind of like a dielectric, or and that's why certain minerals, say like mica, come up in in certain even you know what you want to call alternate all conspiracy stuff and things like that because why are you it, it can be used. It can be used as a type of shielding. Uh, so, basically, including uh, EMPs and uh, and electrostatic discharge, things like that, because yeah. it. It has a high capacitance, and um, it's a great dielectric. Um, so, 
saying you have a combination of a conductive material and a non-conductive material. Mm -hmm. Layer, layered, and some kind of, and I say coherent pattern, because how, for instance, just jumping backwards now to um, Wilhelm Reich, how a lot of people are familiar with his original work, his first organ accumulators, I believe, were fiberglass and like steel mesh of some kind, layered over and over again. So that that's kind of a larger. You can really give a macro version. You can see that, but now if you micro size it, that's what you can say is kind of going on the side of aircrafts now. In a sense. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask you if the idea uh, is that because you've got conductive and non-conductive materials, as you said, layered, what that causes is, uh, I'm guessing, a a vortex, vortex of a small vortex to be created. Is that what we're talking about, or or what's yeah. called tol, toroid, tol, tol, toroid? I would say that yes, it alters the the modulation of the object's toroidal field, um, th and this is this is something that we're still trying to explain with our data. Um, we it, so a lot of this what I'm saying right now is a theory. We have a pretty good idea about this, but this is why we spend so much time testing and, and doing what we do. But um, it does seem like that what happens is we're the because of that sort of vortex action, it, cre it creates what we're calling a cascade effect, um, and what those that arrangement seems to allow for us to set up a type of binary system to transfer information on. Um, well, in a I, sense, maybe it creates a wormhole that allows uh, things to be you be basically bending space. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because with varying de densities, um, that that and that harkens back even to things like the Philadelphia experiment with their big arc welders and how they came about that with seeing these or or um the Hutchinson's effect, um, similar technology. So it's it's a refinement of what we're seeing relating to oscillating electromagnetic and static fields and such and radio. Uh, um, waves factor in, microwaves factor in, so it's not really just electric waves, it could be all types of waveforms. Okay, very good. We're going to be right back with Jerry Apolos after the break and continue our discussion on holograms and thank you. Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Jerry Avalos about his holograms and free energy. Jerry, are you there? I'm here, yes. Cool. Uh, so uh, just before the break, we were, I guess, talking about, um, I guess, the idea that you're bending space and, and that, you know, what I'm thinking of is, is the idea that you're actually creating a sort of a wormhole that effect. In other words, you're, you're, you're getting a direct, being able to, to make a direct uh, sort of target through going through space from one point to another, right? Um, it would seem, or... It that's the the fun part about the science at this point is that anyone's theory could end up being the right one because there hasn't been any you know proof in terms of empirical data to understand this phenomenon too uh, particularly just because even in the in the manufacturers realm you know having you know the background and academic credentials to to back it up it it kind of doesn't matter until the Academics at large start to say, "Okay, but this might be real or something," and um, and so that really hasn't happened yet. Which I think we're getting closer to, though, especially with which, ironically enough, with the Higgs boson experiment with the hadron collider, um, because at that point, at this point, shall I say, that the academic scientific community has to nod their heads in agreement when you talk about the existence of a scalar field, and so these same information vectors that we're talking about in the holograms are the same ones that they're talking about in the Hadron Collider except we're not you know, using tremendous amount of power to smash things. We're actually using more like of that vortex action um, and or implosion. That's one of the interesting things that we're still researching because this is some, some of the conundrums we have and um, who knows, maybe there's someone in the audience right now at the background who would love to get in on this with us, is that because we're seeing things change, for instance, in, let's say, automobiles. That's one of the best ways we can get our, our hard data, is seeing how our product, uh, a hologram 
in conjunction with our composite material, or AKA Organite mix, um, that we're able to affect the, the car by lowering the toxic emissions out of the tailpipe when we're using the five gas analyzer. And so when we think about how exactly does noxious particulates go down 50, sometimes even 90 percent it within the same combustion chain it just went through minutes ago? What, where is that energy? Where did that energy come from? How is that done? Because usually it takes, you know, the combustion engine, uh, you know, it's one cycle to try to get as much as it can, and it still doesn't get all the hydrocarbons and particulates. Or, or even, and the catalytic converter doesn't even grab all the particulates, and yet here we see it, they go somewhere. And it seems like it, our guess is that until we get some more tests to see what is coming out of coming out of the tailpipe, everything, not just what the state thinks is important, um, then we can tell if we're seeing a transition from noxious particulates and having those break down more into oxygen molecules, you know, more water something so like but right now we're seeing a conversion factor where there's there's energy that we're not we can't account for right now so that's where the free energy part may come in where it's not necessarily it may be free who knows but it's i would say at this point a lot of these devices i would say almost fall more into the category of an ultra efficient device um because what we're doing is it seems to me that we're using more of the latent potential in space then we are necessarily um, tapping into the like that sort of I don't know what people equate it to, but this almost like the some people's perception is like you plug into like this proverbial wall socket of power at zero point, and, or that that when I say latent potential of energy in any given space, they think I'm doing that. And really, when we stop and think about it, right now we're spinning many many thousands of miles per hour. So right now we have all that potential energy if it was, say, we were to smack into something static in space, all of a sudden there would be an explosion like none other. Um, so I would say what we're doing is using that density variation like we were talking about with bending space and time. And this is why it does seem like there is some magnetic um, Similarities to seems how that similar sort of toroidal um, effect range uh, field seems to be present, um, and the varying densities of materials once again correlating with others' research in relating to bending space and time. So yeah, everything from Hutchinson sticking, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, um, a wood piece of uh, wood wood piece through a block of aluminum. You know, and having them unscathed, or same thing like how you get into some of the higher um, black ops projects that get into portals and dare I say time travel things like that. So yeah, I think we are may we may very well be doing a smaller version of that, like you're, you're saying. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm also thinking of what's called signal non-locality and the idea that you know that telepathy, for example, and and so on. In other words, you can get information coming. That information is is trans trans transiting space and time to connect from one mind to another, so to speak. And so it's doing that somehow. And um, it is a very interesting idea. Um, I don't know if if you recall seeing our. Um, our, our TV show that we did that pilot, but we met with this physicist named, uh, I think his name is uh, Sean Carroll, if I recall, and he works, he's at um, Caltech, and he was denying that um, that this sort of thing even existed, but I think he was being paid to deny it in essence, and we had a whole knockdown drag out um, <laughs> uh, showdown at on the on the set, as a matter of fact, in which the physicist actually walked off the set. It was never put on the show, but it actually happened. <laughs> and it was filmed. Um, but they decided to put it on the cutting room floor, the proverbial cutting room floor, because the, the physicist, uh, you know, they didn't want to hurt, hurt his feelings being a Caltech physicist and all that kind of nonsense. But, um, but it does, it's very interesting how controversial this whole subject matter is and um, 
I'm not sure if you have comments to that, but then after that, I would like you to address how very controversial it really is because you were attacked. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, I did definitely see the, the show. And, and I remember Tommy and I were actually uh, in the same place when we found out, like, oh, what's on? Really? And then we went and checked it out on TV. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I remember that, that scene. And so, and I think that, um, I guess my commentary on, on that whole situation is that from what I've seen myself and what I would guess, it seems that a lot of these type of academics fall into one of two categories, usually. Um, either have the person who's in the know and is pretty much trying to be the only one of the only people in the know, so perpetuating the Illuminati cycle, or you have the other ones who are essentially so prideful they think they're in the know, and the other ones sort of just keep them in, you know, popular society mentality. Um, so to them, it takes tremendous energy to try to tap into the information layer. It's like no, <laughs> because you've been told that. Yeah. Um, so, so I, it seems to me that that's the case. So it's kind of hard to say what that guy was, but seeing how yeah. how how flustered he got, I would say yeah. he it might be the second class because usually <laughs> if someone is in is in the know, they're not going to get all uppity about it. They're just going to be like, "No, I never heard of that. What are you talking about, Gary? Could you tell me about that? What do you know about that?" <laughs> You know, that's what someone in the know does. Just so everyone out there and listen, like, out there listening. So if you, t if someone tells you they're in black ops and this and that, like if they're just going off too much, they're probably not. But if you make yeah. mention of something and you, they start saying, "Well, what do you know?" Oh, really? No, I didn't know about that. You might want to be a suspect. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, right. Exactly. So, uh, but uh, but yeah, in terms of controversy, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've. Yeah, like so we have been attacked here very literally, and we've been cyber hacked, everything. And you want to describe the recent incident there because you know I think it's pertinent to the subject. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, what essentially happened is uh, a mysterious explosion in our workshop, and the interesting thing here is that yeah, we we work with some you know pretty far out there technology, but none of it is inherently explosively dangerous, nor do we house anything that's explosive including like fireworks for fun no it doesn't happen just don't have anything explosive in here and um and so basically what it was an interesting night really um it seemed like any other for the most part except for the fact that we happened to be sending off some very important packages to some very important co uh, uh, contacts and you know, we just get done with that, and we set our, our items off to the side to be ready to be shipped out the next day, and just going and having a break, you know, have have some dinner, and we're sitting at our table there, and all of a sudden, you know, it's like we had a 6.0 earthquake or something just come from one direction, and all of us sitting there knew that that was an earthquake, and it sounded like something either A, slammed into to the building we're into, or something exploded, and so... Now, my main concern at this point, and I'm sure a lot of our, our, uh, our the listeners out there will empathize with this, is that, see, my, my cat was out there at the time. So the first thing I'm thinking is like, oh, damn, well, well, you know, i got to go check on my cat. And so I run out, and I see essentially these flames shooting out one of the windows we have there. And so myself and my partner, Vanessa, run in there and uh, put out this blaze. I mean, it was up to the roof. And, um, and we're looking frantically for... You know the cat if he was around and we didn't see him and we got we did get the fire out and the interesting thing just as a side note here the uh, our machinery was still cycling and everything with the blaze just you know inches away from it it was actually kind of neat <laughs> so it was still going so production that, that our little machine was like nope not going to stop production for an explosion so once it was all out um, we did get our, our stuff, our machine out and stuff like that before the, the sheriffs came. And, and then eventually the fire department came. And now this is the interesting thing because now I just want to give another testimonial to the listening audience out there. If you think the authorities are here to help us, well, they're not. Okay. Um, because the <laughs> sheriffs... Yeah, the the sheriffs seemed like they were they, they had no clue what was happening because they came and they thought they were just dealing with a little how kitchen fire and they're like whoa whoa <laughs> so you see them you know kind of going for their fire extinguisher too and then um 
And the, now the fire department, by the time they got there, now a couple of the fire department, the fire, the fire department guys seemed pretty genuine because while I'm sitting there with the marshal, on the other hand, though, now this guy wanted to pin it on me. He was asking me, "Oh, will you smoke right there? Are you smoke?" Right? I'm like, "Yeah." And he's just like, "Could an Ember have done this?" I'm all, "I'm not sure how an Ember from a cigarette could have caused an explosion." <laughs> Anything right? Here. And, and he's like, "Well, what's this? What's this? This gooey stuff right here?" I'm all, "That's some, you know, resin, you know, craft resin." And he's like, um, and he's all, "Could have maybe ignited that." I'm all, "My MSDS sheet on there would say different." And uh, and so the the, and the thing about this is just more testament to the fact that they're not here to help you. So they talked to one of our other friends who was present at the time, and the fire marshal tells her, like, that I said that it could have been an ember. I'm like, wow, really? So now they're, now they're putting lies in my mouth, too. Uh, same day. And uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get to the hot spot first. So, but I don't think, honestly, I don't think it's a device. I, we really don't know what caused this. I mean, our resident... Um, you know, nuclear physicist, you know, Jim, Jim Stewart came over and looked at this, and the best he can come up in any kind of conventional physics uh, theory would be someone had to put a device here, because what we have, and I'll eventually have you know write up and some pictures about this. Um, you'll see that things like you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have seen art art toolboxes, you know, just kind of ones that you put brushes in, they're plastic, kind of thick, you know, like a regular toolbox. This thing looked like it had been microwaved, and there was nothing in there but pencils and jewelry wire wrap, you know, to wrap crystals with. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, nothing explosive in there, but this was the hot spot. Somehow, this thing, which was directly under our workstation, um, it essentially created a, lot, a huge concussion. And this was the interesting thing, is because it actually bowed out one of the big doors we have here, pushed out the screen on the window. Uh, but not, nothing was blown out in the sense that there were stools in front of everything. Those weren't pushed over. Things on top of the, the countertop were un, unmoved. Um, the fire got some of the stuff underneath, but you can see everything almost stayed in the exact same place. And then you have a huge, super hot fire that can melt this, this plastic like it was nothing, but then we have papers right next to it that didn't burn, and so it's kind of, it reminds but, me, it's very 9-11-ish is actually the <laughs> cowboy thing. <laughs> but but um, let me ask you, I mean, wasn't there, didn't you tell me later that, you know, the door to the garage, or I think it's a garage, was unlocked, and actually you could have been in there at the time as well, right? Yeah, I was literally standing there maybe like 10 minutes earlier. Um, and, I mean, there there is a chance that someone could have slipped in and put something there, but then it's like, where is that device? There's no fragments. There isn't the there isn't even any apparent residue from any part of the explosion. And so we know it's an explosion, not a fire, then an explosion because it was it. You don't have anything smoldering because even the uh, the fire department guys who were there that were really looking at it, they're checking. None of the breakers were tripped. Even during the blaze, the lights stayed on. Everything stayed on. Um, there was no charred sockets nothing like there was nothing that looked like it was smoldering it all came from this hot spot underneath everything um so uh so if there if it was some kind of a device there would be the device or some fragment somewhere um, well unless somebody threw something in there that then you know I, I don't know but you know some high energy something that can you know de doesn't leave a trace yeah it would have to it would have to get Okay, because from what we've, um, you know, just figured out, the, it would, it's, it probably, like, who knows what would have happened if I was standing there, but this thing <laughs> didn't send shrapnel out. So I'm guessing that, you know, maybe it would have been blown back, maybe something broke, who knows, whatever, but, um, because it didn't send out projectiles, um, like, like normal devices do. So could it have been an exotic, Hardware that was placed there, yeah, maybe. Um, but it was it was meant almost almost like a flashbang, in a sense, because those if they're put next to something that's kindled like a kindling, it can start a fire, but it's not made to start a fire. This seemed like it would burn so hot, like I said, that it melted this hard, thick plastic. That I, and I remember when Tommy was here actually, when he checked it out for the first time, and I turned on uh, this guy, you know, regular lighter. 
and held the lighter up to it, and it didn't even smolder. It didn't even start, didn't smolder till I took a butane torch and said, "All right, let's get this thing to smolder." So it took a butane torch, almost full blast, you know, to to get it to start smoldering. So something got way hotter than a butane torch that you use for. And did it a did it very rapidly, right? Mm-hmm. So rapid that it caused the air expansion to just boom and yeah. knock everything out. Yeah. Um, well, look, we're going to hit a break uh, in, very shortly, but before we do that, I do want to say that we've got lots of questions here coming up, so I want to open the floor to questions and say that for the next half hour, we will take questions from the audience, so um, you will be able to ask him. One person is saying, I'm just seeing really quickly in the chat here, um, someone said a, a do, I don't even know what a do is, what they mean by that, a D-E-W. Have been, yeah, I haven't heard of that type of uh, device actually. D E maybe D E W. Um, oh, direct, oh, directed energy weapon. Okay. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. I yeah, I, it, I thought of that too. It could maybe be. It could very well be. Um, because that's one of the things that we experience other attacks besides this one. We've seen a lot of psychotropic attacks, cyber attacks, and we've noticed that, especially the ones that are deal with the um, psychological state. That some of them weren't necessarily viewers or influencer working on the case. You can tell it's technological based, and it was probably from a stationary satellite because once we moved two mi two three miles any direction, it would stop. So it, it takes a little while to position a, a re aim a satellite outside of its two and a half mile or so swath of land that it tends to watch. When you say a directed energy weapon, I I do know a guy who was involved in the in the whole um, UFO thing, who used to film the UFOs off his off his deck in California. Um, he was the one who did the iPod.org uh, site. People will maybe know who he is, but um, he he was a very interesting investigator, and they they uh, they they took him out. But before they took him out, one of the things they did is destroy his house. Uh, to, they they. To, you know, with a directed energy weapon, no other houses in the neighborhood were touched. It was incinerated to the absolute ground, so there was nothing left except some whatever it was, smoldering stuff or whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I would think that if they did use a directed energy weapon, that it would be much more uh, damaging than what happened. Could be, I guess. And I mean, as you know, the military likes to scale their destruction. Um, yeah, you know, or else the concept of "quote unquote" mini nukes wouldn't be around. Um, so, uh, you know, who knows, really? Um, either way, it's it's a very anomalous explosion, um, rather than you know, rack of noodles on what could happen. It's like it's okay, we're gonna go to a break and be right back and take your questions. Thank you. Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Jerry Avalos about holograms and also his, uh, his experience with being targeted um, with regard to the work he's doing. Uh, Jerry, we, we do have people that have put some questions in the chat, and I do want to give the phone number out for the people listening, and we will take questions now, which is 310-421-4053. That's a call-in number, and then you can also use Skype, uh, I guess, to, um, I guess, text in your, your messages or whatever, maybe even call. Freedom Screen 2 is the word, um, the name, which is Freedom, first word, and then Screen, S-C-R-E-E-N, 2, the number 2. So those are two ways to get in touch, and then uh, you can also, uh, we can also I guess you put it into the chat in Revolution's chat, and then um, they paste it in here for me. So that's how that goes. Uh, anyway, Jerry, did did you want to say any final remarks uh, just while we're right before we start taking questions uh, about either um, what was what happened or uh, just any anything about the technology we've been talking about? Well, I guess uh, just to um, cap it up. Uh, yeah, the uh, technology works. It's pretty cool. And oh yeah, we did find the cat. Um, he was okay. And um, 
that um, yeah, I think that this really is you know what everyone hears about that happens with this type of technology. When and when I say this type of technology, I mean stuff that actually is beneficial and could potentially change the the, the trends of how things currently have been run. Um, so we we do see a lot of interesting hurdles. Um, you know, especially for instance, like with the gas technology, you run into all the familiar, you know, ceilings that we know exist with large energy corporations. And so, um, this is why we don't doubt that someone's maybe some of them, their interests, maybe some people with other kinds of interests, may have wanted to dissuade, you know, these these packages from going out, our production to halt, um, because yeah, this this will change things and because yeah we're not out to exploit we're actually out to heal so and we know that people there's people out there who just don't like that fact so okay and uh just while we're on the subject you can also give out i guess you have a website where people can contact you and also uh get information and purchase i believe you're selling these the holograms right yeah, yeah, we actually have a couple of products right now available. Um, that, that's at the Hollow Tree. It's H O L O, kind of like a hologram. So the Hollow Tree dot com, um, and you, you'll see what we have. One of our personal products there for which helps to align the meridian points in the chakra um, centers and keep you uh, a little more energized and uh, balanced throughout the day. So pretty fun little keychains that we got there. And we'll, we'll be updating some more. It's actually, obviously, our production has been uh, disrupted a little bit, but we're just about back on uh, regular production schedule now. And we also have up there our, our uh, fuel technology for the gas store. It pretty much goes on the in- little double adhesive sticker that goes on type, t- inside of the gas door, which does this uh, process that helps reduce the harmful emissions from your car. So really cool if you're on the edge of passing your smog test and very cool for the planet and everyone breathing the exhaust. So, um, <laughs> <pretty fun. laughs> good point. Yeah, right before a smog test. That's that sounds very very useful. Um, okay, so there's a person that's asking, why do you feel free energy is close to being available? They've asked. It sounds like um, they're asking me that, but I would like to turn it over to you, Jerry, and say, you know, that I do think that we are very close to push comes to shove with with regard to free energy and um, there's a number of reasons why I think that but I I would like to hear from you in that regard. Well I think the reason why we're so close is because you know we're doing this on a shoestring budget and there's other people doing the same thing and the reason why we're on a shoestring budget is because you know the big company corporations don't have really an interest in helping us why would they? Um, but But that being said it can be done in your garage, in a study, in your basement, okay, and even just for yourself. And and I know what we're going to be doing with intrinsic energy innovations is we'll be publishing educational material too. So I mean I don't know we have no problem telling people how to make, organize more effective, their own brands. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of like a, a band publishing the music to their to one of their albums. It doesn't mean you're going to be them now. You know what I mean? Um, so. And it's not our technology. Nothing is truly owned. It's all you know, remembered and borrowed. Um, so we're we're that's the philosophy we take with everything. And so that's us. And knowing that, for instance, some of the things we've seen, just the more tangible evidence of why this is possible. Well, like I mean, mentioned, where is that energy coming from that now cancel out, cancels out twenty to fifty percent of hydrocarbons in these emissions? Um, we've seen stuff where applications of this technology has extended battery lifetime. Um, there's been other, other instances such as these where you have mysterious energy that would take to make this transition on either a material level or um, molecular level that just conventional physics right now is having a hard time explaining and we're appropriating it to a specific intention and goal. So. It is in our plans, in our future, to work on the device that is a passive electricity generator. It's not something that's around the corner for us, and maybe, who knows, it just depends on how, how our funding and how much we, we get going here. Um, 
and and yeah, it will be it will be a fun project, and we have a lot of confidence that we can do this because of what we're seeing in our research and even other researchers you can find on the net. We're able to even get say a larger output of energy than what they input using properly configured wire conf wi wire conduits, you know. Um, and then you integrate that with what we're doing with this um, composite material. You know, you can potentially have a um, you know a, ver an en a very effective energy saver. And then we're also experimenting with other types of material, including graphene. And so I'm sure a lot of guests out there might have heard about graphene as well. So um, that whole, you know, this budding industry leads to amazing potentials because you have this supercapacitor basically made from you can what you can literally do it out of tape and pencils, um, and you have yourself a supercapacitor. So yeah, I think that it's it's there, it's been there, but it's up to more people to make the individual choice to believe that they can do it, and because they can't, it's really not that difficult to do some of this stuff for your own. Now, if you want to go make a million billion dollars, well, you're going to have a more difficult time with that. But making it for yourself, yeah, the man's probably not going to care. So they they care more when you go on shows and try to make a company out. So. Yeah, right. Uh, well, okay, but um, a, a person wants to know where you bought your machine. Yeah, we got that from uh, Jeff Harvey at jefftech.net. I, I highly recommend going through Jeff. Um, not that going directly to um, to the other to the manufacturer themselves is bad. Actually, I just kind of don't remember their URL off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, Jeff uh, Jeff does a does a great um, sort of. Uh, customer service role um, in his own variety, which he's just known for, even for his homeopathic uh, products. So he, he'll walk you through the process, and he's a great person to consult on operations. Obviously, he and I get into the very, very advanced stuff, and, and I'm sure one day we're going to have a show on here and talk about our triumph of how we integrated into really cool systems and stuff, because we, um, we do collaborate quite a bit, and he knows uh, more than I do about the hardware. So he can get a lot more specific, especially with the SE5 because he does liaison directly with the manufacturer and Don Paris, the current president. So um, so I highly recommend if someone's interested in buying a machine, you know, go ahead and contact Jeff. It's a great site in general just for fun gadgets and stuff too. So. Okay, fair enough. Um, Okay, well, we, we don't have any other questions that I see right offhand here in the chat. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you if, I don't know if you happen to listen to my show with Paula Violette. Um, well, that was a, it was a, actually a live stream event, but uh, it's now on YouTube and it's on the front page of the site. For people listening, if you didn't hear it, Paula Violette is considered by some to be in a complimentary way, the Einstein of our time, although the actual Einstein, from what I understand, was not all, all that, um, didn't always have his his act together. But but from that point of view is that he, he really is a cutting edge scientist. But in our discussion, he talked about what is in essence the energy that exists within the vortex and within what people think of as black holes, which aren't really black holes and that there actually is energy there. And that energy can also be, um, in, in terms of his super wave, can be, he, he's actually saying that even there is this, this you know, G2 cloud that is coming, um, that we're going to be encountering close to in April, and that it may tr trigger what's called a gravity uh, wave that then come, you know, bounces off or sort of hits and interacts with um, the core, the galactic core, and could cause a kind of a, a, an explosion of sorts. Anyway, um, the reason I'm bringing that up, it may seem like a long shot, but I think that there may be a connection to that and what you're talking about on a much smaller ba level. In other words, that energy is not just going, it's not stopping at zero point, it's going beyond that, and that there's energy beyond that that we don't maybe understand. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, and I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't get a chance to listen to the newest interview, and actually I was hoping to do that today, but just got caught up in traffic. Um, but um, because um, I do actually consult with Matt Pulver, who works very close with, with Paul Aviolette, um, and uh, we have been discussing 
LaViolette's work in relation to what we're doing here for quite some time because now Matt uh, Pulver helped Paul do um, the the um, the graphs for his uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul Violette's mathematics, and so he has a very intimate knowledge of the of the formulas, and so we've looked at these formulas, and what we have have noticed is that we we might be able to solve for some of the variables in that mathematic equation, which deals with the math of materialization, and so we've been trying to develop some experiments. Or we can maybe at least try to see if we can create, make a photon appear from that vortex or the void or that black hole, whatever you want to call it. Um, because this would actually prove that mathematics more correct, correct too. Um, and then also get into all kinds of fun theoretical applications to what we're already doing. Because we, we feel that what we're using right now to create the effects we are with the holograms and organite is one of those variables and so we're looking we're looking to solve for the other ones so yeah we are in a roundabout way we are actually applying a lot of what Paula Violette has been talking about okay yeah cool um, it seems like there would be a dialogue to be had there for sure um, there is a new question in the chat and so what it is is I can't find any hologram sticker content on the hollow tree Dot com website. I only see rings and pendants. Um, not sure what that means. That question, but does that make sense? I think, I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because um, the our stickers, quote unquote, we're not. We don't. We don't necessarily just sell, sell the little stickers that some other companies do. We actually integrate the organ material. So those pendants, those, those little pendants, are actually like, um, you know, they're they're small laminated microorganite in conjunction with the hologram so um, they're give or take about an inch and a half big so they're a little bit bigger than the regular hologram and they're protected so the, the hologram is less likely to get damaged and then the, the organ material itself or that composite material is also treated with the same stuff the hologram is so it should theoretically last longer than just a hologram too so ho hope that clears up some of the the confusion because I know a lot of other companies they tend to have a sticker solution. We know some of the, because it, it can be a very easy way to do it. We just find that um, most customers end up either losing them or they, they get peeled up and they get damaged. So, and I, we just don't feel right about charging people ten dollars for just a little quick sticker. So <laughs> we figure we can at least protect it for you and make it convenient to uh, have on your keychain or something like that. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, and um, there are, interestingly enough, uh, just might be interesting to the audience, um, Jeff Harvey mailed me one of those pendants, what was supposed to have the, the thing inside, and mm -hmm. somebody bothered to open the package and remove the inside <laughs> before oh, I no. received it. <laughs> and as Jeff put it, he had, he had a very sort of healthy attitude towards it. He basically said, well, I guess they needed it worse than you. <laughs> Yeah, apparently so. It's <laughs> pretty funny. Um, <laughs> so maybe there is some value there. I don't know, you know, for what it's worth there. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. You know, if somebody covets what you have, then maybe. Well, it's kind of it's kind of funny actually. Just on that sort of subject, that we, you know, we were working a, a an event and talking about our pieces. They have one of the organ pieces, and this this sweet little old lady comes to our table. And just loves this piece that we have there. It's a health one that you know helps a lot of different things. And she's like, "Oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I could buy anything. I just want to hold it here." Like, yeah, no problem. You know, just have at it. You know, feel feel great. And so we're just sitting there. You know, then the the event starts up again, and you know she's just you know zen out, and you can tell she just wasn't thinking and kind of just walks away with it. You know, because she's just feel, and we're, and me and my partner and I sit there. She's like, Did you see her just walk away? I'm like, yeah. Well, but I kind of figure she needs it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, the funny part too is that you know our buddy, you know, our, our esteemed colleague once again, Tommy, comes up uh, in the story because later on that lady noticed that you know we we worked together, we're talking a lot to each other, and, and so she was embarrassed and came up to Tommy and said, I, "I accidentally walked away with this. So I'm not sure what to do." And Tommy's like, "I'm pretty sure they don't care," because he kind of picked up on the same thing <laughs> that we did, and so he told us about that. And we're like, "Yeah, we saw, we just figured she needed it." So <laughs> we were like, "Go for it." Yeah, we're. we're um, but so it, 
you know, we do have some few more minutes left, and nobody is asking any questions at this moment uh, that I can find. So, in terms of, you know, I guess you were also in touch with um, Stephen Kelly, and we we did this kind of conversation about this. Um, is Stephen Kelly still involved, and in, and are you guys working together? Steve, Steve is actually doing his own uh, projects right now, um, promoting his book and um, his upcoming website. So he's been a little tied up with that. Um, you know, we're we, you know, we're still we still talk to each other here and there, and um, you know, help promote each other when we can. Um, but we've both been uh, sort of on our own paths at this point. Really okay. Sure. Um, just in terms of, of you know what you are looking at and other scientists that are out there, have you been in touch with any other scientists about you know what you're working on and gotten some you know thoughts or advice from anybody that that the listeners would r r you know um, recognize? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I know uh, you know Sean David Martin has seen a demonstration of this technology um, on one of his cars and. I'm trying to think because I've given out a lot of these because I know Bic Bai, you know, our old buddy Bic Bai has also um, had a chance to have some of our stickers in our gas technology. Um, who else? Um, I know there's more in here. And I maybe can imagine. Oh, oh, no, that's cool. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's worthwhile. Now, is there anything else that, that you guys have been thinking about uh, along these lines or, or what you're doing? Because for example, let me just sort of throw things out, which have to do with, for example, you know, Fukushima and radiation and all of this. Have you ever thought of using your devices uh, to counter the effects of radiation? Yeah, definitely. Actually, and that's one of the things. Uh, what we do usually for our research and development, so what we're, we're not charging for healing sessions. Uh, but at the same time, we're not necessarily doing custom ones. What we're doing is we're allow we're selecting people who we have enough space for to be included on this. And so the radiation part comes in when you're working with, say, someone who's going through chemo, and so helping to mitigate the damage with that. And so that's a lot, we spend a lot of time on that, and actually helps us refine the applications for, say, the personal pendants and even the 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 field technology because the same scientific uh, principles will go in it goes into that product so um, so we've seen some pretty good results working with uh, with chemotherapy patients and um, which has been very encouraging I mean so far um, you know we uh, see it seems to they're alive you know that's pretty much what I, it's like what it comes down to is they've stayed alive longer than they were supposed to and uh, and that's what we like to see, and and we're getting good positive feedbacks from from their physicians. So it's been pretty fun on that, and so this is what gives us um, hope for being able to target, say, parts of the environment. And this is something that actually Jeff Harvey and I have talked about: is maybe sometime in the near future here, um, creating an event, an announcement about getting people together who have a radionics device, a Rife machine, or even energy healers who want to get in on it, and then we can target the, uh, uh, an area and, and really and change what's going on there. Because um, Jeff it has um, some other examples of people in the field who have been able to, say, reduce pollution in a river in China, for instance. Um, and uh, so it can be done, and we know that we've seen environment be affected in some other companies who utilize the technology to help reforest, um, you know, forests in, in the hills and stuff. So um, it, it can, it, it's definitely possible where we have been figuring out a good way to be as effective as possible so it's not just, you know, a quick shift and then it's back to normal. So we'd like to figure out a way that it can be more sustained and stable. Okay. Uh, there are a couple questions uh, cropping up in the chat here. Um, somebody's asking if you've had some help from the government scientist that might still be on the inside or help from someone that used to be on the inside. That's one question. I mean, in a sense, Jeff Harvey is one of those people. <laughs> Just yeah. Why I, in case you didn't hear my prior shows with him, I I recommend them. Um, you know, on on my whistleblower radio. Um, in theory, you should be able to do a search on my whistleblower radio for the prior shows. 
Um, but that labyrinth is still being solved by my webmaster. So I don't know if that's even possible, but you could try it. Um, but I have done shows with Jeff Harvey that talk about his his experience being kind of on the inside, although he didn't work in this capacity. Um, it, maybe some of his knowledge comes from that area. Um, anyone else that might have helped you? I actually have consulted and worked with um, an ex-contractor for quite some years, before I even got into this technology too, because it, go it gets into um, the associative logic that goes hand in hand with things like remote viewing, remote influencing, which goes right hand in hand with the concept of quantum mechanics. Um, so that that actually helped quite a bit, and um, and you know I've, I've I was even apprenticed with uh, someone who was a uh, black ops viewer before for a couple of years, and that once again went into the same type of logic, which has which allowed me to be so effective to be able to just jump right in um, to the rain on the reins here with this type of endeavor. So without that background, uh, I probably wouldn't be as effective. I know I, know I wouldn't be as effective as... Sure. Uh, right now, so. Yeah. And, and you, you know, you've also on your own right been working as a sort of a shaman uh, yeah. trying to discover sort of maybe even, you know, more um, indigenous types of, of, you know, I don't know, energies and... Uh, things of that nature. Yeah, so yeah I, I guess I, I'm just trying to be humble. <laughs> so. no, just, you know, just nuts and bolts. I mean, you've worked it, it, it kind of in the Carlos Castaneda-esque Don Juan uh, realms, I, I would say, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely it goes, it, it definitely goes hand in hand with the, the lucid dreaming navigation because it really can be effective over there. You have to understand your own mental, physical, emotional issues, and so it gets in your quintessential, you know, self healing. So yeah, that that was huge, obviously. That that had to be there for any of the other stuff to really get there too. So yeah. Right. Um, somebody's asking. I'm sorry to sort of move on kind of quickly here because we're really getting down to the the wire here on the show. Mm -hmm. How long are your pro products effective for? Is there a warranty? Somebody's asking. Yeah, they they should be effective for at least up to a year, and that's what the warranty is for for um for the fuel for uh, chips. And um, so yeah, that, and they could very well go longer, but that's. What Okay, thank you, Jerry Avalos, for coming on the show. Everyone have a great weekend, and if uh, and Rick and happy new year, and that, um, 